consuming content is legit a full-time job. The average American now spends more than eight hours a day consuming digital content. I mean, eight hours a day is like nine to five. If it's an audiobook, we read a whole book worth of information every single day. That is crazy. After all that we consume every single day, what is our output? What do we do with all that information? Honestly, I felt overwhelmed. I didn't know what to do with it. There were all these great information, these insights, but I couldn't quite grapple with any of them. I just stayed on the surface. It feels like I was just swimming in circles. I was learning more, but I felt more frustrated and confused. So out of this frustration, that's when I started Obsidian. And to be honest, at the beginning, I thought, okay, I don't know if I can continue with this. I mean, with Apple Notes, with Evernote, with whatever Notes or any sort of productivity app that I was using, I tried it and I couldn't quite stick with it. But I'm an optimistic person, so I went ahead, tried Obsidian, and a year later, here I am, and I still freaking love it. There's life before Obsidian, and then there's life after. Not to say there were not periods where I wasn't using it as much, but I kept on coming back and it was so easy to get started again. So here's one thing in Obsidian that didn't work for me and three things that did. Let's get to it. First, the one thing that didn't work for me, which was task management. I know it always sounds controversial, but hear me out. What do you think you need more in order to be more productive? Another task manager or a thought partner who can keep track of your thoughts, help you see connections between different seemingly unrelated ideas, help you keep track of your insights over time and being searchable so that at any point in your life, you don't have to rely just on your memory and still see all the amazing ideas you've built up over time. So you don't have to fall into this problem of, I read a bunch of books, but I can't remember anything from it. Now you might be saying, okay, why are you comparing apples with oranges? What's the connection here? And I didn't see the connection either until I saw this point made by Naval. His idea changed how I view productivity. Now let's define productivity. Productivity to him meant that getting outsized returns for what you put in. So for the time and the effort you put in, what can you get out of it? And of course, like anything in the world, you need leverage to get outsized results. Same for the knowledge worker. So Naval says, if you have specific knowledge, you have leverage. They have to pay you what you're worth. If they pay you what you're worth, then you can get your time back. You can be hyper efficient. You're not doing meetings for meetings sake. You're not trying to impress other people. You're not writing things down to make it look like you did work. All you care about is the actual work itself. So when you do just the actual work itself, you'll be more productive, far more efficient. So in this definition, a task manager is productive if it helps you build your specific knowledge. But if it's just a running list of other people's priorities or your priorities, then even if you tick everything off, if they don't help you build that leverage, then how productive is it really? And so you might ask, okay, but what is this specific knowledge that Naval is referring to? Specific knowledge is knowledge that you cannot be trained for. If society can train you, it can train someone else and replace you. Specific knowledge is found by pursuing your genuine curiosity and passion rather than whatever is hot right now. Building specific knowledge will feel like play to you, but will look like work to others. When specific knowledge is taught, it's through apprenticeships, not schools. Specific knowledge is often highly technical or creative. It cannot be outsourced or automated. So all this hype with, is AI going to replace everyone's jobs? Well, yes, if you're doing something that can be automated, but at the same time, if you have specific knowledge, then it can't replace you. Because remember, AI, it's great at going, let's say from 10 to 100, but taking something from zero to one, creating something, having specific knowledge might be more crucial, more urgent than it was before. Okay, coming back to Obsidian, what does this mean for us? Because specific knowledge cannot just be taught with a course, I am choosing to use Obsidian to build my specific knowledge. No one can do this for me. I can't outsource it. So the two things I want to do is one, protect my time and create space where I can focus on building specific knowledge and really go deeper. And two, distinguish tasks that are priorities for me and priorities for others and try to manage my time for those two things. Task management for me doesn't happen in Obsidian because I am focused. I don't want to be distracted by all the tasks I have to think about when I am in Obsidian. And if you're curious about my system, you can check out this video here. Now let's move on to the three things that work for me in Obsidian. First, minimum organization in Obsidian. Again, a little bit controversial. I know everyone likes to do MLCs, everyone like folders, tags, you know, data view to create awesome systems. And I have built some of those over time, but especially when I start, there is no need for complicated organization. Let me share why. First, 
I don't have a notion brain. And by that, I mean a very hierarchical, very structured brain that works with a database. Uh, I'm someone who can't even write within the lines. And so my brain is more of the wandering type. I like to explore what are the connections between seemingly unrelated ideas, intersectional thinking is something I really care about. So all those parameters make me feel really constricted. And I can't really think within them. So if you chose Obsidian, you're probably attracted to more of this wandering type of thinking than the very structured thinking. So it's important to know whether you have a notion brain or an obsidian brain. Then reason number two is I don't think in folders because I have this wandering brain, you know, in school, let's say we had folders for each of the subjects and you would save notes within them. But actually that structure itself is top down. It doesn't help us think across subjects to see connections between different ideas, even though they're all connected. So, you know, in my computer, I never save anything other than in the downloads folder. <laughs> I just use one feature and that is search. It doesn't matter where the note is hiding. I don't have to remember any hierarchies. I just need to search to find the note I'm looking for. So the result of minimum organization is that I can spend more time thinking about those ideas than organizing those ideas. I mean, if I may quote Einstein here, if a cluttered desk is a sign of a cluttered mind, of what then is an empty desk a sign? If you want to see my minimum organization to get started, you can check out this video here. All right, moving on to the second thing in Obsidian that is a must, and that's syncing between all devices. I know this sounds really trivial, but it is the key to building a note-taking habit. This is the same as people saying, if you want to read, you have to identify the places in your house that you spend a lot of time in and you put books in those places. I spend most of my time in the living room, in my office and in the bedroom, then I put books there. So it doesn't matter when I sit down, I will have a book in front of me, which helps me build a reading habit. So the same with taking notes and thinking through ideas. For me at the beginning, I only use Obsidian on my desktop, which meant that if I was reading anything on my phone, consuming anything, uh, I had to go get my laptop in order to take notes. and obviously Obviously, I didn't do that, which then made me feel like, okay, well, I'm already missing all, all these ideas. You know, why bother? But when I got Obsidian on my phone, then there was no excuse. Doesn't matter what I was doing. I was reminded, take notes in Obsidian. And luckily, syncing is free in Obsidian. You just have to have a cloud drive that works with your operating system. I've also done a video on how to sync this, so you can check this out. Of course, if it's too much hassle, you can also pay. That's an option too. So choose what works for you. Removing all the friction is key. Now for the third thing to harness the power of Obsidian, it is to use the Zetacasta method within Obsidian. This one, truly a game changer. Our brain in the era of information overload is trained to think quickly, right? Just scan, just skim, just bring up little tidbits of stats. Like Microsoft did a study in 2000, the average human attention span was 12 seconds. In 2013, it was eight and it's quickly dropping. I can roll my eyes, blame it all on TikTok, talk about as millennials, how Gen Z are kind of these dancing aliens who use emoji funny and call it the end of the conversation because I know there is no time to go deeper on this topic. So I don't need to offer anything of substance, right? So I just say the same, same things that other people say. Again, I am swimming on the surface in circles. I'm not really going anywhere. So how can I offer substance that's not boring, not judgmental, not cliche? Well, that's where Zetocastin comes in. I cover Zetocastin in detail in this video video here, but if you're new, a very quick recap, there are three types of notes that you take, which are literature notes, fleeting notes, and permanent notes. And the goal of Zetacaston is to put these ideas into atomic sizes and make connections between different ideas. A crucial feature of the Zetacaston notes is that they are atomic, which of course is great because you have to synthesize different ideas. But the key is that because our attention span is so short now, I don't actually dread writing a Zetacaston note because I know it's going to be short. It's okay to be short. And because of that, I don't procrastinate. I just get to it because it's easy. And since we are building a habit, because it's not complex like other systems, the habit sticks. The steps are so simple. There are only three. One, pick an atomic idea. Two, write it down. And three, connect it to another idea. And of course, you can get complicated with these. You can use the idea compass or other thinking tools to stretch your ideas, to expand on them. But if you're just starting, it's more than enough to just start with these steps. If you don't know where to start, again, I've made a video on this. You can check it out. And if you want something that's all done for you, I've got a template. Check it out in the link in the description. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.